Ron, are you with us? Yes, we're now live. Okay, thank you. Good morning. It is uh, March 30th, uh, 2022. Um, and this is, we're at the uh, General Housing and Military Affairs Committee this morning. And um, we are going to uh, hear uh, from our uh, legislative counsel, Damian Leonard, who is sitting in his chair this morning, and he is going to share um, draft 4.2 of Bill H-329 with us this morning. Damian, the mic is yours. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. For the, leg uh, for the record, mm -hmm. I'm Damian Leonard from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, let's hope that's my only slip up this morning. <laughs> um, so the most of you saw or would have received draft 4.1 last night. Uh, this morning, I'm talking with the chair um, based on some of the replies that came back. Uh, he asked me to make some revisions. So that is draft 4.2. And I will point to those as we go through and explain uh, the reasoning behind the revisions. So, um, Representative, uh, Representative Murphy. I just was going to ask, I, I'd like to print that out because I haven't even seen 4.2 and I appreciate the walkthrough, but I'd love to have it in hand. Is it on our website? It should be, yes. Because yes. okay. I just was working from what the chair sent out about this morning. Um, yeah, so that's my question. I prepared for 4.1. So now there's a, and 4.1 was not even on our web page. So now we have 4.2. Is that on our web page? Yes, 4.1 and 4.2 are on the okay. web page. And okay. we'll have um, Demian uh, review what the changes are. They're not substantial, but we will go through that. Yeah, so the, the difference, there's no difference in the wording until you get to the removal of a, a subdivision in there. So okay. uh, that's that's the difference between the two drafts. So if you've read 4.1, you're familiar with the language, um, and I'll point out where language was removed. Thank you. So okay. So the changes from this between this and the last draft we looked at are highlighted in yellow. So I'm just going to scroll down to where those start, uh, and so. In the last draft that we looked at, we were amending the definitions that apply to both public accommodations and fair housing. That has been struck out because of the concerns uh, raised by the school boards and uh, the other uh, associations working with the school boards association about the potential impact on school harassment cases, which are prosecuted under the uh, Public Accommodations Act. Representative Hango. Thank you. Just to be perfectly clear, Damien, so the removal of that language, so we do not reference any of those statutes, means that whatever the schools are, are doing now, they will continue to follow the same statute and this new law would not affect those statutes, yeah. is that correct? That's the intent, yes. Okay. Title 16, isn't that what we're from? Yeah, on? so 16 BSA 570F has those, uh, has those lawsuits brought under the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act. Um, so the, uh, and the, those are brought as a cause of action under under this uh, the broader chapter, and what we're focusing on here is to get away from that. We're amending just the unfair housing practices section, uh, so it'll apply to that. So before prior versions, we've been looking at a definition of harass that applied to the entire chapter. Uh, which raised questions if you have a harassment suit that's brought under a separate um, separate law, but the cause of action is under that chapter. There's ambiguity now about what the definition of harassment is, and an argument could be made that the definition of harass that uh, was in the prior version of the bill for the whole chapter could apply to that. So in this case, uh, We've 
swap that section out for just the unfair housing practices section. Uh, the first uh, change here is on line 10 of page six. Uh, we struck out the word there with and replaced it with, with a dwelling or other real estate. So now the sentence reads, or in the provision of services or facilities in connection with a dwelling or other real estate. And so this is- Can you just explain the non-lawyer, um, the difference there between please, there with- Representative only. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm very sorry, That's okay. Mr. Chair. I don't know why I did that. So <laughs> there with uh, is, so the, the original sentence was to discriminate against or to harass any person in the terms, conditions, privileges, and protections of the sale or rental of a dwelling or other real estate or in the provision of services or facilities in connection therewith. So the therewith refers back to the subject of the first part of the sentence. Um, and the reason why we're taking that out is part of our effort to eliminate legalese and add clarity for a non-lawyer reading the statute. Um, so we're saying with a dwelling or other real estate here. Uh, and then this reflects the, uh, so what I did here is uh, in looking at this, I looked at how this section has been interpreted and how the Federal Fair Housing Act, which has identical language has been interpreted. And the services or facilities language is really, it's not specifically related to the sale or rental of a dwelling or other real estate. It includes, for example, after you've rented to someone, uh, enforcing the policies differently so that they don't have equal access to the services or facilities at the apartment complex or the condominium that they live at. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that, based on, on reviewing that case law and then with the intent of clarifying this and getting rid of legalese, we've struck there with and put in with a dwelling or other real estate. So that's, that's the change there. Um, the next change here is adding uh, the definition of harass specifically applied to this section. So it says as used in this section, Harass means to engage in unwelcome contract conduct that detracts from, undermines, or interferes with the person's terms, conditions, privileges, or protections in the sale or rental of a dwelling or other real estate, or in the provision of services or facilities in connection with a dwelling or other real estate because of. And then another change to note here is that previously, uh, I had in drafting this hastily uh, copied the definition of harass from the employment law to the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, and the protected characteristics are actually slightly different in these. So I've corrected that so that this reads now with the protected characteristics in our fair housing law. So we're not creating a new set of protected characteristics, which could have you know, potentially a broader impact uh, with respect to the bill. Um, so it's race, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, marital status, religious creed, color, national origin or disability, or because the person intends to occupy the dwelling with one or more minor children, or because the person is a recipient of public assistance, or because they are a victim of abuse, sexual assault, or stalking. And that lines it up with the actual fair housing law in Vermont so that we aren't providing harassment protections for a different list of protected characteristics. And I'm, if you want me to compare and contrast them, I'm happy to do that. But the intent here is to make sure we're not changing the underlying law. So a couple important things to note before I get to uh, the rest of this is that this definition applies to this section by its terms on line 17. And then again, with its references to the sale or rental of a dwelling or other real estate, or in the provision of services or facilities in connection with a dwelling or other real estate. 
Um, so it, it, the intent here is to clearly separate it from public accommodations or any other suits that might be brought under this chapter, including under 16 BSA 570F, um, which is the, the educational harassment. The, uh, on page seven from line six to nine, this is the language regarding uh, notwithstanding any judicial precedent, harassing conduct need not be severe or pervasive to be under unlawful pursuant to the provisions of this section. Again, we're clearly stating of this section, uh, not a reference to the chapter as a whole. Um, and then in determining whether conduct constitutes unlawful harassment, the determination would be made on the basis of the record, uh, according to the totality of the circumstances, uh, and a single incident may constitute unlawful harassment, and that can be considered in the aggregate, and conduct based on multiple characteristics viewed in the totality rather than in isolation. Conduct uh, may constitute unlawful harassment regardless of whether the complaining person is the person being harassed, or the complaining person acquiesced or otherwise submitted to or participated in the conduct, whether the conduct is also experienced by others outside the protected class, whether the complaining person was able to enjoy the benefit of ap applicable terms, conditions, privileges, or protections in the sale or rental of the dwelling or other real estate, or to obtain services or facilities in connection with the dwelling or other real estate despite the conduct, whether it resulted in physical or psychological injury or whether it occurred outside the dwelling or other real estate. So with all of those, uh, we're taking the same language that we had in the employment law and applying it to fair housing. What has been removed here uh, was the subdivision below this, which uh, the chair asked me to remove it this morning. It essentially was a belts and suspenders section adding an additional statement saying this doesn't apply to anything under the Public Accommodations Act or uh, 16 BSA 570F. Uh, because this, line, this subdivision already says as used in this section and then repeatedly says with respect to a dwelling or other real estate, my interpretation is that uh, it's not necessary, but I had in the first draft 4.1 added the other section uh, as uh, essentially an additional clarifying statement. Um, and the chair asked me to remove that because we're already being clear that it applies to this section uh, and, um, <clears throat> and that it applies only to dwellings and other real estate. So rental or sale or provision of, of services or facilities in connection with them. Representative Murphy. Um, I just think it's important to share that. I think that it's also due to the letter that's on our website that um, Before, one yeah. of our witnesses yes. requested uh, this change before yes. the committee even saw what was drafted. Yes. I just Correct. need to put that on the record. That, that is yeah, okay. And that's fine. So the, the chair asked me to make the change, um, but my understanding is yes, he, he had so the committee reviewed didn't, the letters that had been submitted. And, and, and I was going to bring that up. Well, what I would like also to say is in defense of that being removed because it was just belt and suspenders. Uh -huh. um, we're getting near the end of the changes here, so I think it's not inappropriate to say that I am very concerned that pieces I have put on the table is having a Okay, okay, about. okay, stop right there. Um, when we finish this walkthrough, we are going to give the mic to you to express all your concerns, okay? Are we going to address them, or are we just going to let me we're, say them again? <laughs> well, we're going to hear what you have to say, okay? I think it's interesting. Interesting well, way to deal with it, but thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Representative Hango. Um, I think I'll defer till the end um, because I feel like I might have the same, um, okay. some of similar things to say. Okay. All right, fair enough. So, Damien, if you would continue, please. That, that's actually it for the walk. Yep. Okay. So the the struck language is available on draft four point one, um, same page lines nine to eleven. Um, so those are uh, the, the two options there. I can take questions on this. Uh, these were the changes I was asked to make. 
My understanding, though, is that there are other sections now for the committee to discuss um, and that the committee may have questions on this. So I'm happy to take questions or give way to committee discussion of the, the bill as a whole. Okay, so um, that would be good. Uh, we're going to uh, turn this over to uh, Representative Murphy um, to express some of the concerns that she has expressed to the committee in the past. And I think it would be good to have you uh, here to, uh, to hear them again, okay? Jimmy? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be staying with you. Yep, great. Representative Murphy. Well, I, I appreciate that we do often put in belts and suspenders pieces. I think there's intention in doing that. It clarifies things. But um, I've had a concern with pieces along the way, and I will take you right to them so we can follow them and not make it difficult for people to just be looking at it in abstract. On page two, and we're working with draft 4.2 because that's what the chair is deemed today. We didn't even get a chance to look at 4.1. Um, 4.2. And on page two, lines 18 through 21, I have asked to be removed several times. I have been told by Ledge Council that it is not common in any way, shape, or form for the notwithstanding statement to be connected to the provisions liberally, narrowly, in any of our statute. That that paragraph, the provisions being construed liberally, construed narrowly, is used sometimes, but that it was unique or very near unique, that it was tied to a notwithstanding. I think with the expansion of what we're doing on the statement and definition of harassment, it, it is more than what we should be taking a stand on. I think that on this circumstance, leaving the notwithstanding language so that it prefaces where we are saying and where our statement began many months ago, weeks ago, with harassment and discrimination need not be severe or pervasive, that's the one we want to say, has been precedent, and we're saying it should not be considered precedent. I think it's very important to keep those pieces connected. And my understanding, as it's laid out here, is that you would just then renumber on page three, the two to be a one and the three to be a two, and strike the paragraph one. So that is what I've been asking for, and I'm concerned none of these drafts have ever even highlighted my concern, let, her, let alone remove it before the committee even saw it. And the other would be a repeat of that on page five. Barbara, could I, Chair? Uh, Can yeah. I finish my thought, please? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to talk yeah. more about that one. This is the same. It's okay. the same language. Okay. It's, it's all one piece. So it's on page five. We repeat the exact same under small c, lines 18 through 20, and then one through two on the following page that it's the exact same notwithstanding that things be construed liberally and narrowly. And again, when I raised my concern, I was told that it's done anyway, it's common practice. So it's just belts and suspenders or however you wanna look at it unnecessary to have it in our statute. And so I'm not quite sure why it isn't able to be at least highlighted for discussion. Well, it is being discussed right now and they, Although it hasn't been highlighted, it hasn't been discussed uh, at any length with the committee. So that's why it remains in the bill until we can have a committee discussion surrounding uh, the removals that you suggest. Thank you very much. Then I guess I would be concerned with why language was removed from 4.1 before the committee had a chance to discuss no, 4 it. 4.1, we, we already, uh, 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 Ledge Council has already reviewed that for the only language changes in 4.1 to 4.2. He has reviewed those and that, that. These, the language you suggest to re be removed was not removed from 4.1. Right, but you just said that because we haven't removed it, it's because the committee hasn't discussed it. Correct. We didn't discuss what was just removed from 4.1 either. Well, again, we're, it, so this, is open, just, this is open for discussion right now. I Thank you. Okay. Representative Kalaki. Um, Barbara, I, I just want to make sure I understand. So you're feeling that this these this section these two sections th there's no need to because we've defined this there's no need to tell the court they should look at it liberally is that my concern is that when we ask them to look at it liberally in being open to what could be considered but look at it narrowly and what we're looking at is exemptions and we put the emphasis on it by putting it in statute, which is what we've been told by our ledge council is what this does.
that it is court practice to do it often, but if we put it in our statute, they must. And we are saying, you shall. So my concern is we're already saying a very liberal translation and definition of what harass is. Very liberal, which I think is great. I want people to have success in bringing things forward. But I think this is beyond. And I would use as a defense that every time I've pointed out examples of harassment in this committee, it's been seen as a joke. And they have been examples that could have been taken to our court of ethics that I, as a third party witness, was seeing something I thought was harassment. So I just lay it out. We're writing state statute. We're not making intent. We're not giving guidance. We're writing law. And I just feel that that is a step beyond what this bill should be doing. And I think if we take it, this bill needs to go to judiciary. And I also feel that we don't even know where this bill is going because it didn't make crossover. So there's a lot of unknowns, but I'm not willing to let this one go out of the room without really saying we didn't finish our work on this. And as a, as a representative and a member of this committee, to be feeling like I'm second rate to information that witnesses are bringing to us and voices they have, does not leave me feeling very well for the voice I have here for my constituents. Second. <clears throat> Third. Yes, Representative Pango. Um, so I had my hand up earlier and I was yes. going to wait. Um, so my objection to the underlying premise of the bill has already been discussed many, many weeks ago back in January. So my, my objection now is to the process. And Representative Murphy brought it up. The, the very, um, last night we got an email saying that version 4.1 was available. So late last night, I read through it. Um, and then I walked in here this morning and 4.2 is now available. And 4.1 was not even on our web page last night. So the process of this, that nobody had a chance outside of us and whoever wrote 4.2 knew that 4.1 was even in existence. And now 4.2 is here, which I did not have time to digest. Um, and the, the, apparently the changes were at the request of a witness, which really disturbs me about the process because this committee has not discussed this bill in many weeks, several weeks. And I have objected to this past years um, and I'm gonna to continue to object to this type of process. And then beyond that, I totally agree that this bill needs to be seen by judiciary because this is out of my comfort level of understanding. Um, these types of statutes and how they're going to affect um, people in the workplace and in the housing market, although I know we are the housing committee, but this is very um, much out of my realm when we come to talking about official branch. So that is what I have to say today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hango. Representative Walsh. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, yeah, I think it, it probably is a good idea for this to go to judiciary after it leaves us uh, for some of the same reason. I've already been expressed. Um, and part of the reason uh, for that is that I would support leaving in uh, paragraph one in both of those places cited by Representative Murphy because they do express legislative intent. And that is something we definitely have done in other bills, but try to make it clear to whoever is trying to interpret this statute, whether it be lay people or a court, this is what the legislature intends the bill to be doing and how we intend it to be interpreted. <laughs> but then again, that could be something for judiciary to take a closer look at because there's more use to deal with that sort of issues. Uh, so I guess I would argue for, yeah, Let's, let's do our work to send it to the judiciary, but also I would leave in the, the first paragraph on the notwithstanding, just to make sure our position is clear. Thank you. So there you have the reason that that language remains in the bill, and it has nothing to do with 
any type of harassment or anything. There has been there has been no agreement uh, in this committee as to whether or not that language should be removed. And so it stays until the committee agrees uh, by a majority of, uh, of a vote or uh, or straw poll that um, that language should be removed. So that is the reason that the language has remained in the bill. Uh, Senator, uh, yeah, <laughs> Representative Murphy. I just want to share that I, I do argue um, with Representative Waltz that it can be our intent. It's not in an intent block. It's in 21 BSA and 21 9, BSA 9 and 21, 21 BSA and 9 BSA. We're putting it in statute. We're not putting it in an intent block of this bill. And so that's very different. And it's not something that has not been done. As I said, we have testimony from our ledge council that the pairing of that paragraph of liberal and narrow with the notwithstanding is not common. It's very rare if it exists at all. It's a really big statement to be making. So I argue that. And I would also say that we haven't discussed it because every time I brought it forward, I was told discussion would come. So to keep saying that the committee hasn't had this discussion and now we have. No, I didn't say it didn't, we didn't have a discussion, Representative Murphy. I said we have not reached a consensus as to the removal of the language in this committee. That's right. what I said. Right, and I would right. argue that because we haven't discussed it, because well, every time I brought it forward, well, it was not permitted to be discussed at the time. We have heard you and we understand what your position is very well. Uh, what I am saying is that we have not reached a consensus in this committee as to whether or not that language should be removed. And that's what we need to do. I agree. And, okay. and, and I would once more state that we did not come to agreement on removing the language from 4.1 either. And it was removed. From where? From 4.1. From 4.1. Language that was removed was not agreed on by this committee to be removed. Well, again, that was, we just had a walkthrough and to promote discussion as to whether or not that uh, amendment should have taken place. But the and language we're at it, was we're, removed. We're at it right now. <clears throat> We're hearing that right now. Representative Kalaki. Thank you. Um, Damien, I, I, I think uh, Representative makes a really good point. I wonder if we remove that section, in your opinion of this draft, would it change anything in the interpretation in the courts of this law if it's enacted? Uh, it was removed. So if you separated the yep. notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary from the broad construction language, uh, I think that would potentially have an impact because what you're saying is when you put in notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary, you're saying notwithstanding anything that you, the court, deem was not a broad and liberal construction of this, construe this broadly. So you're saying you can ignore judicial precedent that you think was not construing this as broadly as it's supposed to be. The judicial precedent is that remedial laws like fair housing and public accommodations and the employment discrimination law should be construed broadly. I and mean, uh, in reviewing case law on these, I came across that phrase multiple times at both the federal and state level. Um, so that is existing case law, but when you put in the notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary, you're saying you can ignore judicial precedent that didn't construe this broadly uh, in favor of the plaintiff. So there, there is a difference in the words there um, and that courts read statutes to give the words meaning. So when you add something in or you take something away, uh, they interpret it to have meaning. Uh, and so uh, with respect to that, the, uh, you know, that, that is potentially a substantive change. It's hard for me to speculate about where that would happen. And I'm sure the advocates can provide more context to that. Um, but that, that is potentially a, a substantive change in the bills there, um, more so than just adding in the construe this broadly. Um, so the, I think that answers your question, does yes. it? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think that 
I would no, I think you were going to finish a thought on this. I, I actually just wanted to clarify my testimony from earlier because uh, you had asked about uh, asked me to confirm whether there was a letter in support of the change the chair asked me to make. And there was. I should also state that the VSBA and the other groups sent in a letter asking for a larger carve out. Um, and those are both on the committee webpage, but I just wanted to yeah. be clear that there were two letters. Um, and I, I, you know, have to be have to be clear about the, the two opinions that are that are there. So that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. So no, I I don't appreciate that, and I I just wanted to be clear for the committee that that the the request was on, and and I do know that we had asked people to work on the whole question of when we saw the conflict with the Ed Ed statute that um, because of the way things are drafted, that it just did go into, it spidered out into things we hadn't anticipated. So I, I think we had those discussions. I think those were things we talked about. Um, but I would ask you just, am I correct in remembering that the, the joining together of the notwithstanding with that um, broad construction language is an anomaly in our statute? Uh, yes, I believe that was my testimony. Um, and I'm, I'm looking back here to see if I can find my search of the statutes on that. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, broad construction language by itself is fairly common. Um, dozens of instances, maybe a little bit over 100 within the VSA. Um, but I'm not familiar with the notwithstanding judicial precedent. Uh, language appearing together with that. And I'm just pulling back up my um, my search on that. And it's actually the, uh, there is no instance that I can find of notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary appearing in the actual statutes. I can't speak to intent language or construction language that might appear in session law that's harder to search. Sure. Um, the three instances I can find in the statute, uh, well, those actually look like they're from session law if I'm looking at it right now, but the way they, the way they read was nothing, notwithstanding sections blank, blank, and blank of this act, nothing in this act shall be construed to alter the substance or effect of existing law or judicial precedent. So saying we're not, we've written this here, but we're not trying to alter the precedent. So th this language is, is new for Vermont. Um, so, but with the severe pervasive, it uh, yeah. clearly because that is the judicial precedent, you're saying we're overriding that precedent Absolutely. to the contrary. With the uh, construing it broadly, uh, I've I've already sort of testified to the the difference between saying saying that as the lead-in versus just saying this it's the intent of the General Assembly that this should be construed liberally. Thank you, Representative Hango. Did you have your? I did, um, and I'm I'm still trying to follow the paper trail. So forgive me if this makes okay. absolutely no sense at all. But I'm back on to the process of this. So last night when we received 4.1 and I looked at it, there was nothing else on under the date of yesterday, March 29th on our calendar, on our web page. And this morning now we have 4.2 and I was alerted to the fact as we sat down here that there had been a letter from one of the witnesses that was on our web page. Again, it was not posted on yesterday's date so I would have had no knowledge of it. It's now posted on today's date, along with the new version 4.2. Um, again, we had not discussed 4.1. Um, and now as I'm digging into the various layers of our website, I'm seeing that there's also testimony, written testimony from the school boards and the principals association, et cetera. I would never have known to look for that, nor would I have known to look for Bo Yang's testimony because I was still on 4.1 until we sat down here this morning. So I find 
this all moving too fast for me to read the testimony and understand what it's saying and comment intelligently on it. So I do want to bring the rest of the committee's attention to today, March 30th. If you look under the, you've got to click on the bill number and then click on the witness testimony and you will see new testimony for today. But if you click on the date, you will not be, I don't think you will be seeing the additional testimony that has been submitted to us in writing. It's all on, I, I, I'm sorry, it, it's all on the documents for today on our committee website. And I read them all this morning. Okay. It may just be a refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, that yeah, could, yeah, that could that. very well so be. It could there. be my mistake, but I will go back again yes. and see where I typically look, which is our documents page, which comes up immediately. And then I look on today's date. And as it loads. Okay, it is now on there. So I, I did not have a refreshed copy. Uh, so forgive me for that. Um, Representative, oh, yeah. I, but one, one final okay. thing, when we yeah. receive an email that there's a new version, it, it would be good to know that there, because last night it was not on our webpage Understood. that I could, that I saw it would be good to know that there was testimony backing up that new version. I think that that would have been helpful. Understood. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair Stevens. Material was, was posted as soon as it was received. I made a decision about changing 4.1 to 4.2 <laughs> based, on, based on the letter and, um, that I received. So that's on me for not, for not doing it differently. But the material is posted as soon as we get it. I, I, will always be open about putting it forward. I know it's not a question of one person's sensitivity towards it. It's about doing it the right way. So that material was 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 posted as soon as we received it this morning. And um you know as to you know as to Representative Murphy's points sort of when I walked in um the decision to have a conversation about any particular material was never finished. It was never a hard stop or a hard no. We haven't finished work on this bill. And I think I've, I've mentioned it before that we would, yes, get to it. If it was interpreted as being ignored, I apologize. Um, or put aside or not treated with the respect that it, may, that, that it seems to um, have done. It's, that's on me. You know, but this bill, this bill isn't going to be buttoned up or finished or anything until there is some form of consensus, regardless of what that consensus is. And until that happens, we will continue to hear your concerns and the concerns of others on it um, as we move forward. It's as simple as that. And I, and if I gave the impression that that I was stonewalling or that I was being um, underhanded. Which is which is what I just um, don't really feel is what the case was, um, and if the process wasn't held up to people's to, to people's standards, then I apologize for that. That's, that's on me. I'll just leave it there. Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative Hango. Thank you. I appreciate that, and um, in no way, shape, or form am I trying to say anything was underhanded. I'm just trying to figure out where I missed and um, the, the this bit, the SBA, et cetera, the V's testimony says that they were addressing changes in draft 4.1, which when I got the email last night, I couldn't find on our website version 4.1. So I don't know if I was just not finding it or if it was not posted um, last night because clearly they looked at it and had time to write testimony and submit it for today. So I'm not sure where 4.1 was other than in my email box, inbox. Representative Bumley. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I am wondering kind of where we go from here. 
Um, does it make sense to take up 4.1, which had the other, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the provision that was, um, does not appear in 4.2 and talk through um, Representative Murphy's concerns and any other concerns that folks have with, um, you know, with the, the bill um, in that iteration so that due diligence to um, the feedback that we've gotten from the school boards um, and, and uh, et cetera. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, okay, so where do we go from here? <clears throat> okay, well, um, right now we're in the process of discussing these concerns. So I would like to <clears throat> address the notwithstanding language because uh, having spent thousands of hours in courtrooms in, in Vermont um, and having actually read probably thousands of opinions um, on various motions and such, I think that the notion that um, more guidance to our judiciary is um, appropriate, is uh, has value. Uh, when you're saying notwithstanding um, uh, other decisions, it gives a, uh, it starts at a clean slate so that a judge can look at the evidence in this case and make determinations based on this evidence and um, not solely or even at this point remotely um, on precedence. Um, so the weight of that evidence is very, very important in determining the case for a judge. And I would stand by the notwithstanding language because <clears throat> I do believe that our judiciary deserves all the guidance they can have from the legislature concerning um, le uh, laws that we pass. Um, and I think that this language does do that. So, uh, Representative Parkey. I'd like to kind of chew on this a little bit. Okay. And for me, I, I want to make sure I understand um, if we just took out line 17 on page two. Page three? Are we 4.2ing or 4.1ing? 4.2. Page two, uh, line 17. Yeah. Oh, Representative, uh, well. Well, I just, I, I think he's that, asking for. Uh, so hold on, please. So if we just took out line 17, notwithstanding, would it make any sense to keep that next section, the, the number one in there, or does it need a, a header? So, it, so we're still saying it should be constructed liberally. Sorry, go ahead. No, you, you have it backwards. <coughs> On that page, the notwithstanding stays because it translates over to the next page of two and three, where we're emphasizing the harassment and discrimination need not be severe or pervasive. Okay. So right. we, we want to notwithstand that in the past. Okay, so I, so it's the I, block. I want to sue on this. I understand. Yeah. Right. So line seventeen needs Space. to be there. Number one is the thing you're questioning, and then later in the bill, on page five. On page five, you're saying on page five. Where? What line on page? Line I'm sorry, eighteen through twenty. 18. You're, you're tell me what you're it's the exact same notwithstanding language to, to take that out yeah that, that, holds, that holds correct seat. yeah and i understood the first one the reversal tell me why this one what's the first two for you so i why this why you're suggesting taking this out because when when i was a few weeks ago discussing my concern I had a concern with all of it, and I still do. And the notwithstanding language was explained to me as being something that is common practice, so that it's not necessary to be in it. I think it puts an emphasis on a change of the harass that isn't needed. I think that it's already been done <coughs> by the severe or pervasive, and making that be a notwithstanding. I think that's the statement we were working on and has been the continuity of this bill. And I, I, I felt comfortable that Ledge Council was 
was making it very clear, as did witnesses, that, that it is court practice to use this broad construction language in their actions. So I didn't, I don't feel it causes harm to remove it. I think it adds emphasis to have it in that I'm not comfortable with. I think it's beyond what is necessary. Okay. Yep. Yep. Process of more so I, I, I'm hearing. Yep. Thank you. And Representative Murphy, if I can ask just it, you know, what I'm hearing you saying, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you feel like emphasizing something does what to the notion of what it's emphasizing? That's what I'm unclear on, on your objection to it. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm honestly not connecting the dots between between what's there and what your concern is, and I just want to I just really want to try to understand that. Um, in, so, just does that make sense? Um, well, I I there's two different areas, so I I think that to carry the conversation to that level, I we really need to talk about the notwithstanding connection to the, the broad construction language. That's the first piece on page two. That's very different from on page five, where it's just in general to legislative intent that we notwithstand. So that is a follow-up of the fact that it is the exact same language. And if I'm asking for its removal in one section to be consistent, I felt I should show both. The one that really causes me grave concern is where we are setting precedent, doing something that's a complete anomaly in our state statute and tying notwithstanding to that broad construction language. So the one on page two is the one that truly concerns me. The one on page five is for consistency that it is the exact same language, except that it is not prefaced by the notwithstanding statement. So page five is also prefaced by notwithstanding. Right. They both have that, oh, yeah. that lead on. Right. So it would so it would be removing that first line of that. And maybe right. that's unconsciously why I was triggering to it. So I guess in that one, at least removing the notwithstanding from that section where it's legislative intent. Um, so where are we now? You're on page. On the page five, because I had the okay. two different. I know. So, well, the, the repetitive. So let me get this clear. You're suggesting we move notwithstanding language from both um, sections on page two and page five. <laughs> no, that, because no. that's that's the confusion, and that, that is confusing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. That's why I think I was going with remove the notwithstanding link or the um, broad construction language on both, and I hadn't triggered on it being notwithstanding. So on page here, so. five, is it in section C? Is that what you're yes. suggesting to remove the yes. entire section? Uh, yeah, or at minimum, removing line eighteen. On page five, at minimum, removing line eighteen. Okay. Yeah. So what about. Oh, go ahead. And, uh, well, do you want to finish your thought while you? What about page two? On page two, removing lines eighteen to twenty-one. Again, that entire section. Well, but leaving the notwithstanding because we tie it to okay, the severe or pervasive, which is what we do. We've been trying to do from the very beginning. That was the goal of this bill. And, and so, if I may, let me. So, the issue is with the first with the page two material is that you're uncomfortable with the precedent that it might set or that it is setting according to testimony but in but without the notwithstanding language in page five it's okay to say this is what our intent is to give a direction to the courts or to whoever reads is that this is what our intent is and that and that you may feel that that's sufficient to cover areas that in in Two. Because it's in a chapter that is titled legislative intent, right, right. rather than in a chapter that's titled unlawful employment practice. Right. It's no, very, I'm it just, is. I'm just, yeah. again, yep. I'm just trying yep. to make the points because yep. 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 all this time, one of the reasons I wanted to like stop and have this conversation this clean with this kind of bumpers is because I'm not, I'm not seeing the same linear. Right. Thing that you are yep. so a little bit closer on on, on understanding yeah, me, too. Thank me you. too thank you you're welcome glad we could at least have an understanding <laughs> yes 
Well, I'd like to believe that I see things in a linear fashion sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Plumley. Yeah, um, uh, this is a question for Damien. Damien, <clears throat> so if it, it, it seems to this layperson <laughs> that notwithstanding any state or federal judicial precedent, the contrary is a statement in and of itself <clears throat> that signals to a court that the court has the freedom to break with precedent um, in making a decision about whether something is harassment or not. It's not just the freedom to break with precedent. <clears throat> it is a direction that, that says your precedents that are to the contrary of this do not apply. Uh -huh. Okay, thank so you. So that, that's, that's, it's, it's not just saying you may, right. it's saying any precedent to the contrary is is now out of the picture, you have to apply this. Right. So that being said, anytime you change the statutory law, the court looks at that as an intent to change the meaning of the law. The, I forget the exact wording of the canon of construction, but it's, you know, we interpret the, the words of the legislature to have meaning so that they all have meaning. So if you were to even just say uh, harassment and discrimination need not be severe or pervasive to constitute a violation of this section, that by itself would signal to the court, you know, hey, we've got to look at this. By saying notwithstanding any precedent to the contrary, we're saying ignore all that prior precedent when you're con mm -hmm. construing this. And so it's a stronger statement. No. But it's basically saying the same thing as adding in this language that says it need not be severe or pervasive to constitute a violation. With the broad liberal construction, we've typically just said, you know, that's that's sort of construction language. When you're looking at this court, construe it liberally as a remedial statute and construe any exceptions narrowly in order to max, maximize deterrence of the behavior we're trying to protect against. So, um, and sometimes we say the opposite. We say, you know, this shall be construed narrowly to these things we've specifically outlined because yeah. we don't want it to go beyond that. But here we're saying, construe it liberally to accomplish these remedial purposes. So when you're looking at these words, give a broad construction to our intent here because our goal was to remedy discrimination. If you say notwithstanding there, that by itself, that statement has power to say, there's now you know, room to argue that in the past, that precedent wasn't a liberal construction. And so that, that becomes basically that, that clause in and of itself has, has independent power where you're basically saying ignore any prior precedent that's contrary to this. Um, so the by itself, the language, this section shall be construed liberally. Um, it's sort of a, a restatement of our intent that this is a remedial statute which reflects court constructions. There are there is an argument potentially. And again, I, I'm trying to walk a fine line here of not speaking on either side of this, but there is a potential argument that especially decisions from decades ago may not have been as liberal as a court may construe them now in terms of remedying discrimination because of changing views on the issue of discrimination and harassment within the workplace or in public accommodations. So you could say notwithstanding any judicial precedent to the contrary, <laughs> And basically saying you can over, you know, we would like you to overrule anything that you don't think construed this liberally. Um, without saying that, you're basically saying this shall be construed liberally. And the courts still have the power to overrule their prior decisions, but it's it's a really high standard. And it happens very rarely. Um, those are, we hear about those cases a lot press if the Supreme Court overrules a precedent, but those are very few cases out of many, many cases that are out there. They're just the ones where it's, this is a sea change in the law. So it's 
it's significant, but the courts, when the courts are looking at this, they don't overrule precedent lightly. That is a, that is a really big step for them to take. When you change the law on the page though, they have to look at it as a new law and give meaning to the words on the page. Um, so to the extent those change the law, such as getting rid of the severe or pervasive standard, that's a sea change and the precedent is going to have to be removed. Saying notwithstanding any precedent to the contrary reiterates our intent to overrule that precedent. Um, I am familiar with other state legislatures saying explicitly, you know, um, to the extent that this conflicts with the holding in X case, it is the intent of the, you know, this particular legislature to overrule that holding. Um, and I've, I've seen that in intent statements in other states' laws where they disagree with the holding or they believe the holding is not consistent with their intent. Um, but uh, so that it's not absolutely unusual, but it, it typically is reserved for when you're clearly trying to change the law like you are with the severe or pervasive standard here. If that's the change that the committee intends to make, saying the notwithstanding, it, that it may not be 100% necessary, but it makes sense and it provides sort of a reiteration of the intent to the court. With the provisions being construed liberally, I think the question is whether you think there are there is precedent out there that may not have been construed liberally and you're asking the court to revisit that because that's what that notwithstanding <clears throat> at that point, to, at least in my interpretation, that's what it's saying. And the, you know, you have a couple other attorneys on the call today who may have different thoughts about that. Um, but the, uh, you know, that that's potentially, because you're going beyond just the normal, this is our rule of construction here, which is what they've applied in remedial statutes anyway, or at least that's what the court states that it's applying. Um, so there's room for disagreement whether decisions are actually doing that or not, um, but that's, that's not for me to say. So, um, yeah, so just to, to clarify the conversation, Representative Murphy, I think there are two potential options on the table. One is to just strike the notwithstanding clause with respect to that liberal construction language in the two places. And the other is to remove the, the liberal construction language entirely and then leave the notwithstanding language with respect to the severe or pervasive standard um, in both cases. So, um, and it, it's worth noting in the fair housing and public accommodations, we've added the liberal construction in the intent section because there isn't a section like that for employment law, um, although we could add one. That's another option, not to confuse things. But, uh, the, but the actual severe pervasive is in the definition of harass in the fair housing language, um, which is the source of the concerns from the school board because they have a different definition of harass that they have to apply. Um, Representative Murphy. It's not understanding it's time. I just was yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you would have to hand up. <laughs> okay. More than enough time. So please. Okay. Um, I I just wanted to put, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I think it's I think everyone's clear on what I'm asking. And so I'm just going to make as a motion what I'm asking. And then we can get a straw poll on it and it can be done. Because I well, my question is, would you and um, Damien is proposing. I'm, I'm going to clarify what Damien's what what I'm asking for, and and okay. I think it's within what he was presenting. But okay, it's it's what I'm offering. So okay, and you would like a, a straw poll on that? I think so. I think that's the best right way, to, and then people can offer alternatives. Okay. But Let this is what I'm looking for. One question now, Representative Pango, would you like? We're about time for a break here. Would you like time to make some comparisons between four point one and four point two? Uh, um, on the break and we can make it a little longer and that does that make you more comfortable i appreciate that however i the questions i have between the two 
I don't think could be answered in that short of a time. So okay. can you do anyway. I okay. so I give up to them. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to make a motion. Okay. Um, that what I'm asking is that on page two of draft four point two, we remove the language on lines eighteen through twenty one, and renumber two and three to be one and two on page three. Slide on photos. It was removing eighteen through twenty one. Page two. And then on yeah. page three, numbers two and three become one and two. And on page five of the same draft, number 4.2, we remove line 18 and bring the small c and capitalize the t of line 19 to leave the construed liberally broad construction language in that section where it's the legislative intent, but remove that total line 18, which has the notwithstanding. Okay. Not the entire section C. No, just okay. just line eighteen, line 18. Okay. and move the Very small clear. C down yes. to line nineteen okay. and capitalize the T. Well, that's just a progression as to correct move section. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> Representative. Well, okay. So you're forming, you're making that informal motion. Um, yep. Is there a second to that motion to have second. a straw poll on on the the language change proposed by Representative Murphy? Second. Yes, Representative Byron. Thank you. Representative Hango. Yes, discussion on that. I yep. would like to know because I'm still struggling with the judicial terms, terminology, um, if that's what Damien just told us or not. Yeah, so that would remove the notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary from those sections. It, it also gets rid of the, so it gets, gets rid of that. Um, the piece there where it says we're not just reaffirming this, you know, sort of uh, liberal construction that you already apply to remedial statutes. We're saying notwithstanding anything to the contrary. So it gets rid of that um, with respect, and then it gets rid of the liberal construction language altogether with respect to the employment discrimination section. Um, so you're just left with notwithstanding precedent to the contrary uh, need not be severe or pervasive um, and uh, behavior that uh, or conduct that a reasonable employee uh, would consider a petty slight or trivial inconvenience shall not constitute unlawful harassment or discrimination. So setting the floor. Um, the, so you, I can I can show you all what this would look like. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. How much time do you think? Oh, it will take me two minutes to to make the changes. Two minutes break. Yep. Okay. Very good. And the motion is on the floor. Yes. Okay. I I, I don't actually know what we're doing right now. That's that's, that's why we're taking a time break so we can all. <laughs> <laughs> 